Good evening, beloved. Aren't you so excited to be at family camp? It's just so good to be with God's people. Uh, there's uh, only one thing that's going to be better than that is when we're with the Lord by sight, not just by faith like we are now. And I, I just look forward to that time. I look forward to the time when, uh, when all these uh, things of the earth that we battle through, all the struggles that are around us are over. Uh, but until then, I'm going to walk by faith. How about you? Not by sight. And we, we're just really excited about that. So uh, really, uh, really excited, as Mr. Wilson said, about um, going through the book of Isaiah. I have Isaiah chapter 40, if you want to go ahead and turn there. I was a little bit jealous of some of the other folks that got some scriptures that, that talk particularly about Jesus. Jesus is my favorite one in the universe. I like talking about him. Um, so I'm probably going to talk about him anyway a lot tonight. Is that okay? So uh, we're very excited. So... Uh, there came a man sent from God whose name was John. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are so thankful that you have given us so many reasons to believe. Not just the beautiful universe of the, this natural creation, Lord, is enough to convince us that, that there is a God. But Father, you've given us reason to believe in your specific revelations. And one of the, one of the reasons we believe is because of the fulfillment of prophecies. And so, Lord, as we, as we look at these, we're just thankful, Lord, that you, that you and your great mercy and love have given us reason to believe. Uh, you, you haven't uh, made us grope around in the dark trying to seek uh, you, Lord, as if... Uh, as if you were far away. Uh, you, you told us uh, you, you're, you're near to everyone, and I'm thankful, Lord, that, that you have made yourself known. And I pray, God, that as we continue uh, to, to seek your, your wisdom and your knowledge through the Scriptures, that we would be encouraged this evening. I thank you for the saints. Thank you for uh, our hope that we have of the resurrected body and an eternal life with you. And I pray, God, that these things would drive us to do greater things in the kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah chapter 40, we're going to read verses, uh, starting verse 1 there. Before I read that though, you know, there's a lot of bad news in the book of Isaiah, especially if you're on the wrong side of the right. You know what I'm saying? There's a, there's a lot of warnings in there. There's a lot of prophecy actually about even people going downhill, people exchanging good for evil, calling evil good and, and good evil, exchanging light for darkness. There, there's a lot of, of, of pictures of condemnation. There's a picture of how people are going to, to really go away from God and turn away from Him. So I'm so excited that as we're looking at chapter 40, we're looking at hope. We're looking at God uh, giving us a picture of how his plan's going to come about uh, as, he, as he prepares to send Jesus to the earth in the flesh. So this is exciting. So I hope and pray that as you're reading this, you're, you're reading it with great expectation. Maybe not like the folks who read it the first time. Uh, maybe they weren't quite seeing it. Maybe they weren't quite enough into tune of the spiritual things to even appreciate this, but we certainly are. Amen? So verse 1, comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hands double for all her sins. A voice is calling, Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough places and let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord be revealed and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice calls out. Then he answers. Uh, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up. Do not fear, says the city of, say to the city of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them into his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. Let me just tell you what I've been doing for the last couple of weeks. As I've been reading these scriptures and preparing 
you know, all these songs from Handel's Messiah have been in my head. As a matter of fact, I even misquoted this a couple of times because I was doing it from the King James. I had to actually read it instead of quoting it. And so my children, particularly Josiah there, has been suffering with me singing in my very, very poor uh, operatic voice with great zeal about every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill made low, the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough place is plain. This is good news, folks. This is something to get excited excited about. And we're looking at it in retrospect and we're receiving the benefits from it. But the Lord has always been someone who's per, who has been a preparer. He's been making ready His salvation. I mean for 1500 years He prepared the people of Israel so they could at least have some kind of knowledge or glimpse of what His plan was going to be. And those who were looking would be ready. And they wouldn't be surprised. And so here we have a picture, a beautiful picture of good news. What words of hope uh, that there would be a voice announcing the great coming redemption of the Lord. Comfort, kindness, uh, the, the Lord is coming, warfare is going to be ended. All these things which of course mainly speak of the spiritual inner turmoil that's going to be relieved by, by, by the forgiveness of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit, a peace that passes understanding, a love that uh, is beyond human knowledge, a, a hope that doesn't disappoint. All these things are being promised. It's just a beautiful picture. And today I'm not actually going to spend a lot of time in Isaiah. You know, I, I, I told you I was a little bit disappointed. I wanted to talk about the bridegroom and not the best man. You know, every you know, I was a little bit disappointed. But as I've been studying this, man, it's hard to narrow down the, the good messages when we're talking about John the Immerser. It's really hard to narrow those things down. So it makes me think that maybe a little bit later we're going to do a series just on the great message, uh, the messages and the great um, lessons we can learn from John. So I've just picked a few tonight that I hope will be encouraging and will motivate you. So today we're going to see how John the Immerser uh, spoke these words of comfort. How he indeed, uh, many years later, spoke kindly of the things to come. How he prepared and announced for the people to prepare the way of the Lord. And more importantly, we don't, you know, education in and of itself for the sake of education is nonsense. Okay, We want to know what this means to us how we can be better followers of our Lord, and maybe how we can do these same things that John did with such a great attitude, even during difficult times, so that we can advance the kingdom of God. So the first thing that I want us to see tonight is that John knew who he was. He fulfilled prophecy. He knew his identity and he knew his purpose. Now the Holy Spirit, in a couple of places, let's look at Luke, Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 4 through 6. The Holy Spirit testifies to us that John fulfilled this prophecy that we just read. So let's just let's let the Holy Spirit speak here. Luke chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one cried in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every ravine will be filled and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will be made straight, the rough roads smooth, and all flesh will see the salvation of our Lord. Mark records this thing as well in chapter 1. So he was the fulfillment of the prophecy. But what I want you to hear more than just the fact that he was the one was the fact that he knew it and he acknowledged it himself. Turn to John chapter 1. You know, everybody's confused about who John is. They're wanting to know who he is. They're thinking maybe he, he is the one that's going to, to be the Christ. And, and so he, he makes this statement in John chapter 1 and verse 23. He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord as Isaiah the prophet has said. So here's the thing. He said, guys, this is me. When you read about that in Isaiah, it's like, this is me right here. And can you imagine? I want you to think about that just for a second. Can you imagine looking into the scripture and reading a prophecy and saying, guys, this is me. This is talking about me. I am the one that's mentioned here. Now, we're going to hit that a little bit harder in just a second. But just, just store that in the back of your mind for a moment. He acknowledged it. And he believed it. It gave him direction. 
It gave him focus, and it gave him purpose. Now, can you j just imagine with me just for a minute? What if John had had doubts? Maybe he had lack of faith. I mean, he, 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 he had talked to his mom. He had talked to his aunt. He had talked to people. The Holy Spirit had made a few things known to him. You know, he, had been, he was told who he was. But, but what if he had had doubts? Maybe he's like, you know, maybe it's not me. I wonder, I wonder how readily he would have accepted the persecution for his message if he had thought, maybe it's not me. So I just want you to just kind of imagine, what if he had had doubts? Imagine with me again. What if he had had dilemmas? And what I mean by dilemmas, what if he had had an earthly agenda or a fleshly agenda? What if he loved the things of the world? What if he loved the temporary comforts and the pleasures of the world? What, what if that was on his mind? I mean, after all, who wouldn't want to wear his clothes and eat his food? You know what I'm saying? You know, th this is not something that people just volunteer and say, yeah, let's go for it. What if he had had an earthly agenda? You see... When you accept that you are the fulfillment of the prophecies, doubt goes out the door. When you believe that by faith, doubt is gone. And when you have a heavenly agenda, I need to tell you this, and don't go misquoting me here or, or misapplying things. When you have a heavenly agenda, the internal battles start to fade away. When, when heaven is your goal, when your focus is Jesus, and you want to do the Lord's will, a lot of those things that we quote-unquote struggle with, and by the way, don't use that word struggle so lightly. What most people mean when they struggle is they mean I'm losing terribly. I struggle with it, and they mean that they're losing. You know, if you struggle with something, that means you're trying to beat the thing. You're trying to wrestle it. Uh, so when you use struggle, make sure you use it correctly. No, struggle does not mean surrender. That's what most people uh, mean by that. But, you know, the struggles start to fade because the, the, the desires that, that once tempted you just don't mean as much anymore. So I'm very thankful that he had faith. I'm very thankful that he had a heavenly agenda. John was on a mission. He preached repentance. He preached the kingdom. And he preached Jesus. You see, people on a mission, a couple of things happen. One, they get things done. And secondly, some people might even say unfortunately, they get people's attention. If you're on a mission, people start noticing what you're doing. Can be good, can be difficult. Some of the folks that listen to his message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then, as we'll talk about later, his, his, his teachings about Jesus. People, I mean, people who listen, they repented. They were immersed. They turned around. They were looking for the truth. They wanted the truth. And so, I want to tell you this just to encourage, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to keep it vague. Keep it vague for just a second, okay? When you're on a mission, you'll get results. Amen? If that's your focus, you get results. And so, he was getting good results. Now, there's some other results he was getting. Because when you preach, when you're a person that's on a mission and you preach, some of the powerful and influential people notice as well. And when John was preaching, some of the powerful people came with pretense and they faced the firm words of the prophet, you brood of vipers, who warned you? If you're coming here, don't come with your mouth, come with fruits of repentance. It was tough for them to hear. See, they call he caught their attention as well, and their bad motives started to reveal themselves. Just know that happens to a person on a mission. He was so focused and on task that even went further than that. It cost him his freedom, and it eventually cost him his head. But he was willing because that kind of drive the kind of drive that a walking fulfillment of prophecy has, that kind of drive will get the job done. Amen? When you know that your fulfillment of prophecy and you're focused, you have faith, you have a mission, it's going to get the job done with or without your head, with or without your freedom. The job's going to get done. Now, I want to suggest to you that just like John we need to know who we are and acknowledge it to ourselves. Believe it. Have faith in it. 
and proclaim it to others. We need to do it. Now, you remember the question that I asked you a few moments ago? I said, can you imagine looking at prophecy in the Scripture and realizing, oh my goodness, hey, that's me. Well, I want to tell you tonight that you don't have to imagine that. You do not have to imagine that because it's just as true for us as it was John the Immerser. Now, I often refer to Ezekiel 36 when I try to help us to humble ourselves a little bit and say that it was for the, the name of the Lord, His sake, for us to, uh, for the work that He's going to do. But sometimes in the midst of that, I get so excited about exalting the Lord that I forget the things that He's done. So I don't want to do that. So we're looking at Ezekiel 36 and 37. Just, just turn to a 30, 36 first, just for a moment. Because we're going to find you tonight. Are you ready? We're going to, you know, John said, look at Isaiah. He said this, a voice crying in the wilderness, make way, uh, make straight the way of the Lord. He said, guys, that's me. And he, and he came to realize that and it motivated him. Guys, I want to suggest to you that Ezekiel 36 is about you. Ezekiel 36 is about you. And I hope that I get, I get chill bumps when I, when I think of this stuff. When I think that the Lord so long ago had me in mind and prophesied about me. Now, there's some that say that the Old Testament does not prophesy the church. Yeah, and that's why... They're, to use the word, Lord's word in several places, they're useful for kingdom, useless for kingdom work. Because they are, there's no power behind it, there's no faith behind it. And they believe that they're an accident, they're a parenthesis in the plan of God. But I want you to know that God, from the creation of the universe, before the creation, had you and me in mind as His sole purpose to save mankind. Just as He prophesied that John was going to come, He prophesied that you were going to come. He prophesied that you were going to come. Let's just look at a couple of things that he, that he prophesied about you. Keep this in mind. This is you. So many things. Uh, man, I have to start. I'm going to start in 22, but you need to see it. Start in 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. Guess who the Lord's talking about? The Lord's going to prove himself holy with you. He's going to prove his holiness to the world through you. He's you know, a lot of people say, I don't have to prove myself to anybody. I wish that we could just kick the American culture out of the kingdom of, of, of Christ. We need to get rid of that. The Lord proves himself. Are you better than him? The Lord works hard to prove himself. And then he says things like, and thus prove yourself to be my disciples. Prove it. Don't just say it and say, well, you can't judge me. Well, yeah. I hope people are judging us if we're not out there proving it. You know, when we talk about doing the will of the Lord and walking in the footsteps of Jesus, we need to understand that this has nothing to do with us. It's all about proving the holiness of God. And I hope that gives us a perspective that's not self-centered and we know just how serious this is. The Lord prophesied that, that we would be the proof of His holiness. Verse 24, If I will take you from the nations, gather you from the lands, and bring you into your own land, then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from your filthiness and from all of your idols. He's talking about you. And we say... Praise the Lord. Yeah, He's going to clean us. But what else is He going to do? Moreover, verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Friends, He's talking about you, giving you a new heart, giving you His spirit, so that there is a people that exists that can prove that the Lord can create a people who can do His will. Can we do the Lord's will? And we can do it. And every aspect of His will. Please Him in all respects, as the Apostle said in Colossians chapter 1. We can do that. So the Lord so long ago spoke of how He was going to create a people. He was talking about you. You need to believe it. And this people might be a meek people, but they're certainly not a weak people. 
Turn over to, to chapter 37. We'll start there in verse 7. You remember uh, the prophecy there, speak to these bones, speak to these dead bones. We'll pick up in verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise. Christians need to make noise. Amen? Amen. Need to make noise. Just know that. We need to make a difference. Uh, I get so many side issues. Okay, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and, and flesh grew, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and then breath came into them, and as they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope is perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of the graves, my people and all, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of the graves, my people, I will put my spirit within you, and you will come to life, and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I am the Lord, that I the Lord have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. When you read this, let it sink in that this prophecy is about. You. Just like, Isaiah, just like John when he looked there in Isaiah. He said, this is about me. This is about you. The new spirit that's within you gives you power to go out there even as, as you once were dead, you are now alive to go out and do the work of the Lord. This is about you. Friends, this is you folks. And these are the kind of people that are described in chapters 36 and 37. These are the kinds of people that get things done. But I want you to listen to me. But if we have doubts, like I suggested, what if John had doubts? If we had doubts, you know, you know uh, how am I going to prove the holiness of the Lord? Do I really have a new heart? Do I really have His Spirit? Can I really please the Lord in every way? Can I, can I walk according to His statutes and His ordinances? I'm not sure I really can do that. If, if, if you have doubts, we are going to fall short of our purpose. It's just going to happen. If you don't think this is you, if we have inner dilemmas, we're going to fall short as well. You see, the people who have a new heart, the people who are not just an army but a supernatural army, cannot have divided interest, cannot love the world and the things in the world. Because if you love the world, you cannot love the Lord. If there's divided interest, we're going to fall short See, that's why John the Immerser was able to go forward even into, into imprisonment, even to death, and get the job done because he was convinced and there was no dilemma. And friends, we need to be convinced that we are the fulfillment of prophecy here today in this world by faith. And we need to love the kingdom of God and not love this world so our interest will not be divided. And I'm, and, you know, it might sound like when I get loud, it's because I'm excited. It's not because I'm yelling at you. I'm, you know, I'm excited because as I'm, as I'm thinking about this, I know people. I know a lot of them. A lot of them in this room who believe this. I know so many of them who, who, who their loyalties and their commitments and their focus, they're not divided. And these are the people who are getting the work done. These are the people who have a hope of heaven that drives them to, uh, to turn away from the distractions of this world. And I want to thank you for being such a people. So we can learn this from John. And I hope and, I hope and pray that we understand that we have that in common with him. Maybe the second thing I want us to see about John was not only did he know who he was, but... This might seem a little obvious, but maybe not so obvious. But he knew who Jesus was. He really did. He knew who he was, but he also, now listen carefully, this is really important. He also knew who he was not. He understood that. And he made sure people understood that. Even from the beginning of the ministry, he said as plainly as he knew how, in John chapter 1, he said, I am not the what? Christ. I'm not him, guys. I am not him. Let this sink in. I am not the one. Of Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He said, 
of Jesus, this is whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for, I, for he existed before me, John 1, 15. And he goes on a little later in John chapter 1 and says, this guy, uh, the, the, the thong of his sandals, I'm unworthy even to untie. But people still didn't get it. His disciples, man, the people who followed him, the people who were loyal to him, almost were making it a little bit more about John than they ought to. Turn over to John chapter 3. Let's start in verse 26. John chapter 3 verse 26. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, who was he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified? Behold, he's baptized and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man cannot, can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves are, are my witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. You see, you have to understand, John's followers were very aware of who John was. They were very aware that he was the fulfillment of the prophecy, just like John knew that. And maybe they elevated him a little bit too highly. I don't, I'm not necessarily saying that, but it's almost like they weren't quite as focused as he was. John was interested in the truth and pointing people to the truth. That's what he said. I told you I'm not him. He existed before me. He has a higher um, office than I do. And I'm so excited about people realizing this that I want to fade into, fade into the background as he comes up. He must increase. I must decrease. He was interested in the truth. As a matter of fact, turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10 and let's... Oh... Let's start, start in verse 40. How about Jesus? And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. And many came to him and were saying, While John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. Many believed in him there. Man. Don't you wish that could be said of modern day preachers? Everything they say about Jesus is true. Man, John, he proclaimed it. He exalted the Christ. He knew his position, but he knew Christ's position. In other words, he knew who he was. He knew, John knew that he himself was important. He knew that he was great. He knew that he was an integral part of God's plan, but he was not the center of the plan. He was not the focus of it. Now, he we have to acknowledge this. He was great. Doesn't it say that in Matthew eleven eleven, 11? Among those born of women, none were greater than John uh, the Immerser. None's greater than John. But he knew Christ was greater, and he was willing to vanish and fade into the glory of Christ so that Christ could be seen and Christ could be exalted. Now, I want to tell you, I'm thankful that I am in Christ and I know you are too. And as we're considering who we are in Christ, as we are considering the prophecies that were fulfilled about us, if we consider what the Lord has done for us, we know the words are true in Matthew eleven eleven. No, no one born greater than John, but he was least in the kingdom of heaven is what? Greater than he. We are greater than John. Well, why? Well, first, because we are walking fulfillments of Old Testament prophecy, just like he was, plus we are children of God, according to the Scriptures. We are overwhelming conquerors. We have Christ in us. We are called saints. We are called a royal priesthood. We are called a chosen race, a light of the world, children of light. We are told that we are able to do all things through Christ who gives us strength. We are that mighty army. There are a lot of things that are true. But I want to tell you, when we realize this, there is the potential. Anytime we find ourselves in a position of greatness, there is the potential to lose focus. Now, 
you're never going to hear me slam politicians when I'm preaching. It's not going to do it. I'd rather talk about Jesus. But I'm just going to tell you what I remember hearing. When our last president got in office, he was recently elected. Someone asked him in an interview, and I, and I don't, I, I forget half of these interviews, but this one stuck with me. And he said, uh, asked the president, and said, well, how are, how is Barack Obama, you know, how, how are you feeling about being in office? And he just kind of grinned and he said, well, as you would expect, and who would blame me with this position, there's somewhat of an ego boost that goes with it. Now, that really bugged me that he said that, because he's supposed to be a servant. But I'm not saying this to, to derive one president and to, and to exalt another, because I imagine that many of them have thought that, even if they haven't said it in public. Ooh, I'm the, I'm the president. Mercy, never thought that would happen. Mama would be surprised. You know, all those different things. You know, I, I, imagine, I imagine that they thought that, because there's a potential when there's greatness to lose focus. John didn't lose the focus, and we shouldn't either. I just want you to turn to Romans chapter 1. You, you know Romans chapter 1. A lot of warnings in Romans chapter 1. I just want us to look at verse 25. It's talking about those people who, who, who went down into the, into the deepest uh, trenches of sin. And it says this, for they, verse 25, For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worship and serve the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, I want to do something here. I'm going to change this verse just a little bit so you can get a point that I'm trying to make. I'm going to read it again, see if you can see what I did. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the new creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Do you think it's possible that we can focus on the greatness of who we are rather than the greatness of the one who made us that way? Is it possible? I want to tell you, I've heard it since I've been with the saints. I've heard people talk about the new creation more than they've talked about the creator of the new creation. And if our focus is on the, that which is created rather than the creator, problems are going to arise. And I've witnessed this. John realized who he was, but he was always pointing to Jesus, always pointing to him. He wasn't exalting himself. He knew who he was. He acknowledged it. He knew what that meant, but he always pointed to Jesus. We do not exalt and glorify the new creation. We exalt and glorify the creator of the new creation. Amen? We need to do that. We point to him. And I'm thankful that Brother Jay, who has made strides in helping people understand the new creation, has always, since I have known him, emphasized focusing on Christ in glory. He never talks about focusing on the new creation. We need to know who we are, but that is not the focus. If we make the focus about who we are, we'll find ourselves maybe a lot like some of those folks in, that John talked about in 1 John. I, oh, I'm just awesome. I am without sin. You know, and you know what I mean by that. These are people who thought that they didn't need Jesus because somehow or another they were exalted. Their spirit was exalted to a different level than their flesh. I mean, you know, I, you know I, I'm, I'm separate from this flesh thing. We can get that attitude. We can talk about who we are exalted in Christ and forget about how we ought to serve Him, how we ought to do His will, how we ought to resist temptation. And I'll tell you, if you don't get your focus right, you're going to fall in sin. You are going to fall into that temptation and you're not going to make it. We exalt Christ. We do not exalt one another. And, um, and I'm, again, I'm thankful to be in the presence of people who exalt Christ before me because it's encouraging. I'm thankful to be in the presence of saints who do that for the sake of my children. Very thankful for that. So it seemed that John knew who he was. He was fulfilling a prophecy. We need to know who we are. We're the fulfillment of prophecy. John also knew who he wasn't. And he exalted Christ at every opportunity, willing to fade into the background as a willing worker so that people would see only Jesus. We need to know that as well. No matter how the, how the Lord has exalted us, He is still the, the most highly exalted. And we want people to see Him. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about tonight, I've got so much more I want to say. But the last thing I want to say tonight as we're considering how John fulfilled these prophecies is I want us to think... 
How can we prepare the way of the Lord? How can we get people to prepare the way of the Lord? How can, and this is how I'm going to state it, how can we play the role of John the Immerser in our world today? How can we play that role? And I'm going to give you a few examples. I need a couple of volunteers, maybe kids, ten, two, I need two. I want you to be maybe 10 years old or younger, if you can do that. So I, I, I need some volunteers here. Do I, do I have any? Okay, are you 10? You are, man, I thought you were older. You come right up here. You so mature. You fooled me. Now I get another. I've got someone else coming here. Okay, sit. Have a seat. You're going to sit here for a while. You are too, darling. Oh, man, you guys are so awesome. Let's give these guys a hand. They're in front of this crowd with smiles. Have a seat right there. Yeah. You guys can work together. Just don't be too loud. But you can't. I'm giving you permission to talk during the message, but just really quiet. I'm going. I want you to. Can I hold that for you? I got a carrot, and I'm putting it right here. You're all witnesses. I'm responsible for that. A little play carrot. I'm going to give you that, and we'll put an extra one right here in case you have a little accident. Um, I want you, your job is on this plate, I want you to take this egg and make it stand on end without falling. Okay? You guys can work together. I want you to make it stand on it. So just do that while I'm going. Okay? So how can we be John the Immerser? to this present generation. First of all, we can be John the Immerser to the children that we have in our lives. Train up a child in the way he should go, we read in the book of Proverbs. Deuteronomy, teach them diligently to your children when you sit and when you walk and when you lie down and when you rise. And I want to suggest to you that we are preparing the way of the Lord for these children. We're preparing the way of the Lord so that when they come to the point of a decision that they need to make in their life, that their lives are ready to make the right decision. Amen? Now, uh, I'm, I've a, how's it going, by the way? No. Come on. <laughs> Just keep going there. How, how, how's it? Uh, so, so we need to think about this. I, I got a confession that I need to make to you, and, it, and it's just the truth. It's just the way it is. I've immersed a lot of little kids in my life. I think the youngest I've ever immersed was like six years old. Because, it, you know, t I just didn't quite have the picture. I remember in camp particularly, that's when, that's when it happens, folks, in camp. But I remember never feeling good about it. Never feeling like something was wrong. Feel, feeling that these little kids that were, I remember one little kid that he was just, he would go around and he was just slapping people with their towels. He'd draw blood and everything, but he was ready to be immersed, okay? And I, was, you know, I, I, remember, th I remember thinking that something was not right about that. And it actually took someone who is an enemy of the teaching of the, glory, the gospel of the glory of Christ to tell me, now he, he, he would, man, he would, it's just so funny how when people realize that they need to take a stand, they go against what they earlier had realized. But he, he just said, man, there's something wrong about all these young kids getting immersed at camp. And, and him saying that made me think I wasn't the only one that thought that. And I started thinking about it a little more. The problem is some people think that the only decision you can make for Christ is becoming a Christian. That's the only decision you can make. So we need to make sure our kids make that decision. Man, there's a lot of decisions that kids can make for Christ. There's a lot of commitments that they can make. There's a lot of things that their pure hearts can do. You look at them, they're playing with these eggs. You know what I'm saying? This is, this is a pure-hearted children enjoying playing with eggs, for heaven's sake. You know, their, their pure hearts can do so much for the Lord. It can make so many decisions. It can do so many things before they are immersed. Um, are you, you think you could, oh, oh, tell me what you're doing. Tell me what you're doing there, darling. Are you breaking it? Yeah, that's actually not a bad idea. Uh, let's give them a hand, let them go back to their seats, and I want to show you something. Let me see that. Okay, let me ask you a question, guys. Do you think that this can, that what I'm asking you, do you think it can be done? You think it can be done? All right, I'm going to do it right now. There you go. I did it. That was pretty easy, right? Can anyone in this room... Get up here and do this right now. If I ask you to come up here, could anybody make this egg stand on end? Yeah, it's easy after you see it done, right? I've had people, when I've done this before, say, you cheated. Well, no, I just, I just thought through it. And it wasn't me originally, but I have had some, a few original thoughts. But, you know, uh, but, but, you know anytime someone does it for the first time, I, if you didn't see it up here, I broke it, and it stood you know, right on the end. I just hit it to the end, stood up just fine. You know, Anytime somebody does it, 
The first one, people are like, oh, that's easy. I could have thought of that. But here's the thing, you didn't think of it. You didn't. And many of you out there may have not thought of it. Now, the reason I'm saying this is I'm going to go over a few things here in just a few minutes of how we can make straight the way of the Lord for the children in our lives. And I want you to understand that these things were originally in the Bible, but it took somebody like Mr. Wilson to kind of put it together and say, we need to do it. Yeah, it's easy to say now, well, anybody can do that. Anybody can come up with the idea of a Christian school. Anybody can do that. What's so great about that? He did it. Let's give him a hand. So, so here we have, you know, as we prepare in the way of the Lord for the, through things like, like, like Bible study, helping them to know what the Bible says, help them to, to, to be prepared to answer the tough questions that arise in their own minds when they're thinking about their lives, when they're thinking about the decisions that they need to make when the time comes. Help them to memorize the Scripture so that they won't have so many doubts in their mind. They can actually come, you know, I remember reading about this as they're sorting through what their future is. They're, you know, we can prepare the way of the Lord for them by, by praying, by being a good example, by participating in Christian education, by protecting them from the love of the world and the things that might influence them. I mean, folks, we need to make sure that we're clear in the way of the Lord. And by the way, sometimes when we're not clear in the way of the Lord, we, we get kind of bored of things not to do. And instead of making the path straight, we make it a little bit more crooked. You know that? People do that sometimes. They may make it a little bit more crooked by getting them involved in things of the world, by putting them in the influences that would, that would pull them away from Christ rather than helping them to focus on Christ. You see, I, I realized soon, that, soon after my story about immersing all those little kids, I realized that uh, you know, being, the, being John the immerser to the kids means that I'm working hard to prepare their hearts for the way of the Lord, to prepare them so when the time comes, they'll know, they'll know who they are, they'll know what they need, and they won't have so many worldly influences to pull them away. Friends, that's our job. Amen? We prepare the way of the Lord. The second thing is, um, I just want to stop there just for a second. Um, you know, I'm always thankful when I have saints. I'm around saints that I haven't seen in a while. I'm thankful for all the people that I'm seeing for the first time in a year or so. I'm thankful for all the work that, that you do where you are. But I'm thankful for people who come in my house, in my home, who I see doing this. And I just want to say right now that I'm thankful for all the people who do the work of the Lord. I'm thankful for those on the foreign mission field. But I want to particularly say I'm thankful for the Thomas family. Where are you guys? Where's Benoya then? Where, where, where are you there you are. I want to be thank I'm thankful for them because in my home they exhibit without fail the attitude of preparing the way of the Lord for their children. And I'm thankful for everyone who does that. And uh, it just makes a difference. Uh, so we'll just leave it we'll just leave it at that. You see, our kids are going to be ready. They will see that all that we have said about Jesus is true. Just like the people saw that about John. Oh, all that you've said about Jesus is true. Um, I hope that we've taught them enough about Jesus that when the time comes, they know that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And they make the right decisions, and they will. The second thing, we need to be John the Mercer not only to the children, but John the Mercer to the lost of this world. Turn to Matthew chapter 3. I don't know how. Am I out of time? i got a little more time. Okay. Matthew chapter 3. I just looked at my watch and didn't even look at it. I'm like, I got time. You know what I mean? <laughs> I said Matthew chapter 3. I meant Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Uh, let, let's just start in verse 1. That, that day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea, and large crowds gathered to him, and he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow, and he sowed some seed, and some seeds fell on, by the, on the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell 
fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Now Jesus later explains what this means. The soil is the condition of the human heart. Some, some people's hearts are so hard that when they get the Word, they don't pay attention to it. Satan comes, snatches it away. Some of them are like the rocky soil. Yeah, everything's good. The, the, the Word starts to germinate and grow. But when the persecution comes, when the heat comes, they don't have any roots and they wither away. Uh, the, the seed sown among the thorns, everything's growing good. You know, they're doing fine until they have so many worries and so many concerns of this world that they're hanging on to because they love it so much that they're choked out of the kingdom. And then some of the seed falls, falls on the good soil, the good soil of the heart, and it grows and it produces fruit. So Jesus explained all this. And I'm not going to go into it, but I just want to tell you this. I used to work for a farmer. And when the farmer had seed that fell on hard ground, he didn't say, well, guess what? That whole field is bad. Can't do it. He got out there with all kinds of farm equipment and broke that stuff up and made it usable. When we would be in a place where there was a lot of rocks, guess what? I didn't get to drive the equipment. I was only 14 when I worked for him. But when there was rocks, guess who was the equipment? So I'm picking up rocks, throwing them. He didn't say, we can't use this. He's like, get the rocks out there. That's your job today. I got paid 15 bucks a day. I was rich. Uh, you know, we're from sun up to sundown. Uh, when there were weeds that were coming up with, uh, with the different plants, I particularly worked in tomato plants one year. He didn't say, man, these weeds are going to choke them out. I guess I'll have a loss this year. Guess what he handed me? A hoe. And he said, get to work. My point is this. Just because we see someone who's not ready, whose heart is not exactly right to receive the word of the Lord, doesn't mean it'll always be that way. We've got to get out there and we've got to cultivate. We've got to work. We've got to prepare the way of the Lord for them. And we can cultivate the hearts of these gar the gardens of the lost. But I want, there's a couple of ways I just want to suggest to you is, one, by letting your light so shine among men that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I'm thankful for the people who are out there doing the good work in Texas right now, helping all those folks who have suffered from this hurricane. I'm very thankful for them. But I know for a fact that a lot of them are doing it because the end goal is to help people, humanitarian. That is their end goal. But I've got a question for you. might be rhetorical, but it's not my question. What does it gain a man, if, uh, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? Well, let me change it. What does it profit a man if he gets his house back, if he gets his car back, if he gets his land back, if he gets his life back? What does it profit a man if he gains those things and yet loses his soul? What do you think the answer is? Nothing. You see, the saints who are involved in this kind of thing, whether it's a disaster or whether it's the person next door, the person right beside you, when we go in and we let our light shine and people see our good works and they see our life and they see our examples, our point is for them to see our good works so that they'll know there's something different about what guides us. And then we can tell them who, who leads us, who is the one who motivates us, and he will get the glory. So we can, we can cultivate those hard, that hard ground that's so tired of organized religion and what they've done to the world. And that's true. Organized religion has do, done a lot of bad things to the world. You want to change it? Do a lot of good things to one person. You want to change it? Do that and give God the glory. You're taking stones or you're breaking up hard ground when you're doing that. They might listen to you. Another way you can do that is you can actually reason with people, acknowledge their intelligence and talk with them, reason with them. Isn't that what Paul said he did in Acts 17, Acts 18, and Acts 19? He went and he reasoned with people. He helped them engage their minds. But some people have doubts, and they're reasonable doubts when it comes to the culture or their particular tradition. It, things that are illogical make sense to them. You want to remove some stones? You want to remove some thorns from the ground? Why don't you pull out proof that the Bible is the Word of God for somebody? Man, that, that book is a cultivating book. You can't get, there's nothing in there that's going to tell you how to be a Christian, is it? That book is not about how to become a Christian. That book is about cultivating hard, rocky, and thorny soil. Would you agree with that? That's what that book is about. Get out there and reason with people. You're preparing the way of the Lord. So when they actually read the scripture, they're like, well, you know, I believe this is true. They just proved it to me. I can actually, I can actually believe it. 
You start going to someone and talk about the glory of God, you start talking about the plan of salvation, and they don't even really have any faith in God or the Bible or even God's people, how, how, how far are you going to go along with them? It's going to be hard. We cultivate the... So we can be John the Immerser to the people of this world. But I also want to suggest, I'm already out of time, so this is going to be a quick point. We can also be John the Immerser to one another. You know, the Lord's coming back, isn't He? And we need to be ready. And we need to help one another be ready. Because everyone who has this hope fixed on Him, what does He do? He purifies Himself just as Jesus is pure. He works on, on getting rid of those things that would distract Him, getting rid of those things that would take Him down, uh, lead Him towards the wide path instead of the narrow path. And what does Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 7? He says, because of all these things I just said, it's time to, to purify yourselves of the filthiness of the flesh and the Spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. You see, we are to prepare one another for that time. You see, the Lord's bride. Huh. Let me tell you, <laughs> this is going to sound terrible. Just don't get me wrong on this. Weddings are tough, especially the elaborate ones. I've seen more people. Weddings are supposed to be one of the happiest days of your life. And I've seen more brides like this. You know, oh, two or three days before their wedding, everything's just horrible. I just don't know what's going to happen. This isn't working out. The flowers weren't right. The caterer's not doing things. I don't know what's going on. I've seen that happen more times, and it makes me nervous you know, when I'm here because everybody, there's so much tension. And I've seen a lot of great ones, too. By the way, the simpler the better. Amen. Isn't that true with life? That's true with life, okay? You know, just make it simple. But, you know, weddings, man, they're tough, especially if people hadn't thought things through until the day of the wedding. I always tell people, get, if you're not sure what you're doing, get a wedding coordinator because I know what's going to happen if they don't get a wedding coordinator. Who's going to be the wedding coordinator? It's going to be Phil Sutton. And that is, I have not trained for such a job, okay? But I end up doing it. It stresses me out. The point is, when the Lord comes to get his bride, do you want to be stressed out because you're not ready? And scrambling. We're not going to have a chance to do that. But the Lord's coming, His bride's dressed in white, which is the righteous acts of the saints. I've got so much more to say about that. But do you get my point? Because I'm out of time. Point. We help each other here. We prepare the way of the Lord. Living stones being built together into the house of the Lord, ready for Him. John the Immerser to one another. We need to help one another prepare for the way of the Lord. Friends, I am thankful that John fulfilled prophecy. I'm thankful that he had the news of, of comforting the people, of making way the, ready, the, the way of the Lord. It's exciting to read about it. It's exciting to hear the fulfillment of prophecy. But more than anything, it ought to be motivating because we who are greater than him also have prophecy about us with, a great, with just a great purpose, purpose, pointing towards Jesus, uh, making straight the way of the Lord to everyone around us. And so I pray that, that this truth motivates us to serve the Lord even fuller. Thank you.